Don Hartson's family is at his bedside. They're waiting and praying. We're well, good mates, good teammates, same age, you know, and but for the grace of God, that could have been me. They said at the moment we're not really concerned about the cancer, we're concerned we're keeping John alive over the next um, 24 to 48 hours. As long as he wants us there, we'll, we'll just be there for him 24 hours a day, forever, if so be it. You fight your way through different battles in life, but, you know, this for sure will be my biggest battle. Thirty-four-year-old ex-international footballer John Hartson is currently undergoing chemotherapy in a hospital in Wales for testicular cancer that has spread to his brain and lungs. For the first time on British television, John talks frankly about the events leading up to his diagnosis, the immediate aftermath and his current condition. It was about three or four years ago um, and it, it had gone from a tiny, tiny lump, you know, like a little... Um, just like a small lump, uh, just on inside your, your, your uh, on your on your testicle, um, and I just ignored it basically. You know, I, I felt it and always knew it was there, um, and just ignored it. I suppose I just thought it would just go away. Could I do to make myself sick? Oh no, no, don't do that. Just be sick. We should we try and be a bit more proactive about it and take your anti-sickness before you feel sick. Right. I never sort of um, thought too much about having the cancer with it. Um, maybe once or twice it had entered my mind, but again, um, I never laid there at night thinking, oh God, I could be in trouble here, I need to go and get this sorted out. There were certainly no telltale signs of impending danger. John had come to Scotland after spells with Arsenal, Coventry and Wimbledon and was an instant success. Scoring more than 100 goals in his Celtic career, John was a striker who played with passion and guts. A hard man with a big heart who made up for his lack of pace and grace with a tigerish commitment to his club, teammates and fans. Known affectionately as Big Bad John, he was adored by the Parkhead faithful and was welcomed into the Celtic family. He was sort of a contradiction in characters once he went onto the pitch, you know. The first person he'd look for would be the opposition centre-half, just to try and rough him up a wee bit. Um, but, but like, he, um, you wouldn't see that, you know. He very rarely lost his temper. He was cool with it, like, you know. Aggressive, held people off, you know, and brought other people like myself into the game. Um, great goal scorer as well, obviously. He scored over 100 goals here in, in four or five seasons, which was a tremendous record. Um, so, you know, he's held in high esteem, not just by players he's played with, but obviously the fans as well. After leaving Celtic in 2006, he continued to play professional football, this time at English Championship side West Bromwich Albion. But his new girlfriend was soon to discover John was ignoring the lump. We were in Birmingham at the time and I was teaching in Coventry and um, we'd had a day of... Uh, prostrate and evading cancer awareness. So when I came home from school, I said to John that we'd had these nurses in talking to the children today about this. You know, you know, you need to check yourself down there. And uh, he said, oh, I've had a lump there for ages. It's nothing to worry about. And I said, well, it is. You have to go and get it checked out. We go to the club doctor. John was playing for West Brom at the time. And I said, and we go to the club doctor and ask him to check it. It's fine, fine, I'll do that. So a couple of days later, I said to him, did you get that checked? Nothing to worry about. His words were to me, so I left it at that. So I don't think it was a macho thing, or um, I just think it was a case of maybe a bit of laziness, you know, maybe a bit of, uh, um, you know, well, um, I don't know what it was really. I'm a bit funny like that, I suppose. He never thought that it would happen to him. I think it's something that he thought maybe something that happened to other people, but it just wouldn't happen to him. It was the lump wasn't causing him any problems, therefore. There was nothing wrong, and um, apart from that, so I fell pregnant not long after that, so that probably confirmed in his mind even more that this was nothing to worry about because, you know, we were having a baby. But things were far from fine. Despite his girlfriend's request to talk to the club doctor, John kept things to himself and instead plunged enthusiastically into a post-playing career in the media. So many footballers, when they step off the pitch and into the television studio, are let's say, a little bit difficult to deal with, uh, a little bit pampered, a little bit precious, 
that's not John one little bit. He's the complete opposite of that. And in that great old-fashioned TV punditry sort of way, you ask him a question and he just simply answers it. Not the answer he thinks he should get, just the answer that he honestly feels. But the warning signs were there and John's body began to react to the disease that he was totally unaware he had. I was living a perfectly normal, healthy life, but not being healthy. Obviously, I'd put a lot of weight on. I'd, I'd, blown, I'd blown up to 19 stone, which is far too heavy. I'm, I'm 15 stone right now. Um, so my playing weight was 16. So really, I'd put about two and a half, three stones on, which is, which is far too much weight. My dad used to tell me about my weight all the time and my clothes weren't fitting me properly and I was feeling uncomfortable in the car, <coughs> sweating in bed, all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, but you, 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 you basically live in a, a normal life. I was on 187 flights last year because I was working with Satanta and I was flying Cardiff, Aberdeen, Bristol, Inverness, Cardiff, Edinburgh, you know, and back. And I had a flat in Glasgow. Um, I was doing an awful lot of travelling. I went through a full pack of Nurofen in the airport in about 45 minutes. I was taking two every 15, 20 minutes, which I know you're not meant to, but I was suffering with these headaches and normally when you've got a headache it's a couple of paracetamol and within 20 minutes then the pain starts to but the pain wasn't going i'd noticed that john really wasn't himself um, i thought that his breathing was very heavy and he really just didn't seem at himself so i said to him look john i'd like you to go to the doctor and have a checkup and he said um okay he said and when i'm there i'll show the doctor this and i said good god how long have you been swollen like that for he said oh about two months so I said, right, we're going this afternoon. So that's exactly what we did. We went to the doctor, we spoke about his breathing. I went out, the doctor examined him, and um, he, had, he was then taken up to the Ho Newport Albert Hospital for an uh, ultrasound scan, and really that's where things, the ball started rolling. On Thursday, July 9th, John and Sarah were told the devastating news. John had testicular cancer. Probably 10% expected it, I suppose, but it's not what you still want to hear. Um, and I was actually due to um, to work that evening. It was a Thursday, and I was actually due to work that evening down at um, Parker Scarlet. I was going to do the Llanelli Motherwell game um, in the Champions League qualifier or the European La Liga qualifier. Um, and I never call off work. I, I always try, and I've turned up in work with you know ill and flu and God knows what else before now. So I never call off work. Um, and I had such a bad headache and I was feeling so down with the news. I phoned up Emir, the producer of the S4C programme, and, uh, and I said to him, I can't come in tonight. I said, I've had some bad news. That night, John's headaches became unbearable, forcing him back to his GP the next morning on Friday the 10th of July. Um, I spoke to my GP and she said to me, how do you feel? I said, oh, these headaches are just, they're not, they're not right. Um, and she said, well, OK, we'll, I'll, I'll make an appointment for you now. And that's when I went down then, and they were expecting me at the hospital then. Um, but I, I did that on my own back, if you like, because uh, I had a feeling that uh, something wasn't right. At hospital, he was confronted with unimaginable news. The cancer that had been diagnosed just 24 hours earlier was already in his brain and lungs. The one-time football legend was battling for his life. He went in on the Friday with the severe headaches and then by Monday he was in intensive care and had actually stopped breathing and was ventilated and uh, had to get rushed then to another hospital for the, the brain surgery. So it was a very worrying time and the doctors actually said to us at that time, they said at the moment we're not really concerned about the cancer, we're concerned we're keeping John alive over the next um, 24 to 48 hours. Tonight, first with the nation's news, emergency surgery on John Hartson. Doctors operate to relieve pressure on his brain, but he's told the cancer has spread to his lungs. And then everybody received the news that it spread to my lung and up to my brain. And then they operated, they did, they did two brain operations within a space of a couple of days, I believe. Tests have confirmed that this cancer has spread to his brain. We are waiting the results of further tests to establish a full picture of Mr. Hartson's cancer. We will be commencing a course of chemotherapy later this week and Mr. Hartson has already commenced a course of radiotherapy. You know, in terms of where I was and where I'm at, you know, I think, uh, I think for those who are really, really close to me, 
And for people who are on the outside, I don't think the people on the outside actually will ever. You know, the people on the outside won't, won't actually ever, you know, understand how close I was, you know. In July 2009, one-time Celtic cult hero John Hartson became gravely ill. Testicular cancer had spread to his brain and lungs. John underwent an emergency life-saving brain operation and remained in the care of neurosurgeons. John has little recollection of these events. I can't remember much about um, those three, four weeks, if you like, because I was, I was pretty much out of it.